Good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. We hope you're going to worship with us in your house. And we ought to be used to the, the unusual setup that we have right now. But we're going to ask you, if you can, to, to stand with us, worship as we sing in just a moment. And let's just let God do a work in our homes today. Before we start, we want to pray. God, I worship you. I thank you that I have a chance right now to lift you up in praise and give you glory, for you are worthy of all praise and glory. And today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to hear your word in just a moment, but before that, we're going to lift you up and praise you because you're worthy of all praise. We thank you for this chance. Fill every house today with your spirit. We praise you in Jesus' name. Worship with us.
praise you this morning. You are worthy of all praise. Hallelujah. Once again, we want to thank you for being with us this morning. We want to give you a chance to, to give in the tithes and offering. You'll see a number on the screen in just a second. And if you would, remember to worship him this morning in your giving. And God will bless you for that. Lord, we pray for every soul that's watching right now. As they give to you, they're giving in faith, believing that you are going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings, God, that we can't even explain. But we know you're in control, and we thank you. And that's why we give to you, not only because you said so, but because you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. We thank you, Jesus. We praise your name. Remember, throughout this service, if you have a prayer request, Put it in the comments. Uh, if you're a member of Calvary, put your prayer request in the comments. If you're a guest with us this morning, we want you to do that because the members of this church are going to pray for those needs that you write in the comments right now. Uh, we really want you to take advantage of that opportunity. There's people all across the city watching this today, and we want to bind together. Even though we're not in the same building, we want to bind together and pray over any need that may be going on. And God knows exactly what you're going through today. He knows exactly what situation you find yourself in. And no matter what that situation is, He is the answer to any problem that we could ever have. So put those in the comments. Lord Jesus, touch every soul that is watching right now. We know that you are aware of every problem. And you are the answer to any situation, any need today. We pray that you build the faith of your church today. That we would operate in your faith. That we would believe that you are in control. No matter what the world says, no matter what the news says, that you are in control and that you know the end from the beginning. And you have made a path for us. We worship you. We praise your name in Jesus' name. Worship with us.
perfect love to hold me safe within your promise till the storm has passed when this burden is lifted i'll give thanks to your
Praise the Lord, everyone. Again, I'd like to welcome you to our live stream this morning. We're glad that you could join us wherever you are. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. Pray that God will richly bless you by being a part of this service and worshiping with us together, unified though not in the same body, but still in the same mind and the same spirit. God would bless each and every one of us today. If you would turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse 13. Romans chapter 1 and verse 13. Romans 1 and 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes... I proposed to come to you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Maybe some of you identify with that one. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me is. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. There's a lot going on in this world today, and, you know, there's a lot of opinions and ideas about whether or not to go to church or whether or not to go to church, and uh, some people are making some decisions, and that are highly unpopular with the rest of the uh, religious world. And some people are ashamed at some of the choices that are being made. Um, but I'm here to tell you today, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter whether anybody else calls us shame or does, and I'm not ashamed. I think if somebody wants to have church, they ought to be able to have it. But I'm... All the shame that's going on in this world, I want to say very clearly and very loudly today that I am not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, there's a lot of things in the world to be ashamed about, and, you know, whatever, God has blessed us all with free will to be able to do whatever we want to do. But of all the things in the world to be ashamed about, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed to be an apostolic. I am not ashamed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ and the gift that he has given to anyone who would desire to have it. Amen. And if you haven't guessed this morning, I'm going to be preaching on the title, I Am Not Ashamed. Dear God, I ask you to bless us once again to reach into each and every home each and every place where we are, God, I ask you to reach through. Let your anointing flow. I ask you to uplift us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to help us to place our faith in you. And God, in the midst of all this crazy world, that you would help us to stand unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Thank you, Jesus, in your wonderful, matchless name. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Paul called himself a debtor. That's who we're reading in Romans here. He was not in debt in a monetary sense. He was talking about a much greater obligation than money. He was under an obligation to preach the gospel to anyone who would hear. 
This said to the Greeks or the barbarians, the Greeks were those who dwelt in Greece, and they would be considered during that time frame to be uh, refined and polished and educated. Uh, the wise man, as far as human reasoning would go, the barbarians would be all the rest of us, all the rest of us that were not the Greeks, the foreigners, the ones who spoke a different language, uh, they would be considered unwise or uh, ignorant. And Paul is saying here very clearly, I am not, in, I am not uh, necessarily indebted to a particular class. Uh, I feel indebted to everyone that would hear. Now he's saying, I'm not worried about your educational level. I don't worry about, uh, I'm not worried about your race. I'm not worried about your nationality. I'm not worried about if you came from a royal family, if you had money or you don't have money, fat, skinny, tall, short, whatever it is, bald, have a whole lot of hair, whatever it is, I'm not even worried about all these things, but I am worried about the gospel, and I'm worried about preaching the gospel. And he said in this uh, particular verse, he said, as much as that is in me, I'm ready to come and preach to you in Rome. And Paul would say later on or, or earlier in 1 Corinthians, we didn't come to preach to you, to speak you with enticing words of men's wisdom. We came instead with the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Paul is not worried about how he's going to speak or even how it's going to be received. What he's worried about is that he would preach the Holy Ghost to anyone that would hear. And he basically was saying, is my own paraphrase, but he's saying, I'm not claiming to be an orator. I'm not claiming to speak well or to have some special gift, but everything that I do have in, in me, I am ready to preach. Debtor means indebted, one who owes something to someone else. It's someone who has an obligation to pay. Now, Paul had the wisdom to know that he was indebted to the gospel. And because he had received the gospel, he was also indebted to all men. I wonder today, and you can think about this, you can even answer in your home if you want to, but I wonder sometimes if we have this same sense of urgency and if we understand that we too are in debt. I wonder sometimes if we realize that the gospel that we've had the wonderful pleasure of hearing has made us a debtor. And it's made us a debtor to a lost and a dying world who will die lost without the gospel. Why am I in debt to the world? Where first and foremost, I am indebted to the world because God did something for me. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I, I received something, and you can identify with me, I'm sure. I received something that I did not deserve. And Jesus said, you know what? Freely you have received, now freely give. The Bible has said after the Holy Ghost has fallen, you know what your responsibility is? You shall be witnesses. We receive the Holy Ghost knowing this very simple fact. And if you don't know it, let me break the news to you today. When you receive the Holy Ghost, He wants you to tell somebody else about it. Amen. I am not ashamed of the gospel. There is only one God. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is only one way to get to God. You must be born again, as the Scripture says, of the water and of the Spirit. You must repent of your sins because you are a sinner. You must be baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And you must be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Romans 9 and 33 in the New King James says this, 
As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now think about the Jews. In a way, the Jews had a reason to be ashamed. Everything about Jesus was shameful to the Jewish people. They were a chosen people, and as such, they were a very proud people. And here Jesus is. He's poor. He wasn't born in a palace. He didn't come into this world with a lot of money and nice, beautiful robes. No, instead he was born in a manger, in a place where animals live, dirty, no claim to fame, poor, and also considered probably weak in many ways. I spent some time in January in Israel, and one of the things that I found interesting was all of the talk about the cultural concepts there of fighting, of speaking your mind. Uh, in a Middle Eastern culture, when you speak your mind or stand your ground, uh, they don't have a problem with that. As a matter of fact, our tour guide said, when you go into the, uh, to the market to buy something, don't pay full price. Go in there and argue with them. Get the price down. If you don't, they're expecting you to do that. They're expecting you. They give it a high price so they can go down in the price to give you something. Who's telling us? You need to go in there and fight for something. And you find that in that culture and certainly in that time, they would lose respect when someone didn't fight. And here in this, our day and age in America here, uh, we tend to lose respect when people do fight. Uh, but over there, to stand up and fight is a thing of respect. And you understand that Jesus, the Bible said he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't stand up. It, it was irritating when you read it that, you you know, if you're reading the story, you're thinking, God, come on, say something. When they mock you, say something, do something. You have power. But instead, he kept his mouth closed. This was a mark, certainly, of shame to the Jewish people. They were ashamed of his beginning. They were ashamed of his status. And they were certainly ashamed of his ending. He was hung on a cross, and the Scripture says, Cursed is he who hangs upon a tree. But Paul reaffirms to us that there's no need to be ashamed. In Philippians 1 and 20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. 2 Timothy 1 and 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, he threw that in. Don't be ashamed of me either. I'm doing what I'm, all, what I'm supposed to be doing. But don't be ashamed of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. 2 Timothy 1 and 12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am here today preaching to you to tell you, and hopefully you'll join with me, to say that I stand with Paul today. I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of his suffering. I am not ashamed of his beginning. I am not ashamed of his silence in the midst of mockers. I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed in. And I am persuaded that everything that I give to him, he is going to keep in his charge from now throughout all of eternity. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was clear 
In some ways, he had a reason to be ashamed personally. In some ways, he had a lot to brag about. He said in Philippians 3 and 4, Though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man that he hath thinketh that he hath where he might trust in the flesh, I have more of a reason. <laughs> he said, you think you might have a lot of reason to trust in the flesh? Well, I have even more than you do. And he said, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews as touching the law. I was even a Pharisee. Uh, concerning zeal, hey, I was so zealous I persecuted the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, guess what? I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul was saying, I got a lot of reasons to be proud too. You think you got it all made and you're, you're on your high horse or whatever the case may be. I have a reason to put myself there too. But where I am, I'm standing here and in light of the gospel, I'm ashamed of those things. I'm ashamed of my pedigree in a sense in light of the gospel. I'm ashamed of the zeal that I had in persecuting the Christians. I am ashamed of all of those things, but I am not ashamed of the gospel. He said, it is the power of God unto salvation. And what he's saying there is that it is God's power to save you. What is the power of the gospel? To you, it's the power of everlasting life. It's the power of salvation. The power of God, the power of the gospel, is that it has power to offer you salvation. There is no power in heaven or in earth or under the earth that can save you except the power of Jesus Christ and His gospel. There is power in the gospel. Now, we live in a world that doesn't care a whole lot for Christianity. We have a country that was based in Christianity. It was founded. Our forefathers believed uh, in Christianity, but now it's taken a little bit of a different turn. To the, to the carnal eye, the gospel is really powerless. There are a lot of people that are embarrassed by what we believe. There's a lot of people in this world that think it's shameful to believe in this beautiful Word of God. There's a lot of people in this world that believe this is a shameful thing. I heard one person say a couple of years ago that we were sitting around clinging to God and our guns. That, that Christianity, that the gospel was a crutch to us. And I, you know what, whatever you think about gun control, I don't really care, but I'm clinging to my Bible. I'm clinging to the Word of God. I don't really care what anybody else says about it. This world doesn't even believe in sin, much less a power that forgives sin. And they feel that it's ridiculous to believe in a power that can change somebody. How is that possible without psychology, without medication, without something, some other external influence? They feel it's ridiculous to believe that it's possible for the mind to be regenerated and renewed, for the spirit to be regenerated. And for them, every bit of that is true. The gospel only works for those who believe. And for those who will not believe, well, they're going to be ashamed of the gospel. I heard my dad say one time in a sermon, you got to take the medicine for it to work. You got to take it if you want it to work. It's simple as that. The gospel is alive. It is powerful. It has the power to change your life in ways you could never imagine. But you got to take it. You got to obey the gospel. The gospel was given to the Jews first. Acts 3 and 25. You are the sons of the prophets 
and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed to you first. God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. The gospel was given then to the Jews first. And as the Jews rejected Jesus, he extended his power, thank you Jesus, to the rest of us. Acts 13 and 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Thank God the gospel was extended to you and I. Amen. Jesus was a Jew. Romans 1 and 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Hebrews 7 and 14 says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And this hits to the heart of what a lot of the Jews thought, that God did not say anything about uh, Judah producing a priest. And here we have Jesus coming from Judah being the high priest. This is one of the things that boggled the mind of the Jewish people. The Scriptures came through the Jews, Romans 3 and 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? He says, well, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. God chose the Jewish people to give us the Scriptures, to bring us a Savior, and we owe the Jews a great debt. Amen. Paul also spoke of the righteousness of God. That's another reason that Paul is not ashamed. That is because of God's righteousness. God's righteousness was imparted to us. That's the way that God justifies people, by imparting His righteousness to you. If you are listening today, know this. You don't have to be a perfect man. You don't have to be a perfect woman. But you do have to put on His righteousness in order to be saved. You do not have to become good for God to accept you. As a matter of fact, we see several times in the Scripture where God thoroughly squashes that idea. It's not becoming good that makes you worthy of salvation. It's that you were not good. It's that you were a sinner. It's that God loved you before you were born in your sinful state, that God's righteousness was reaching for you. It is His righteousness that brings salvation. The gospel is our new birth. It is a regeneration of mind and spirit. It is being born of the seed of God. And it is not hinged, thank God, upon the will of man. You can't determine my salvation. You can't tell me I can or cannot be saved. Thank God nobody gets to determine my worthiness to be in God's presence. What human philosophy couldn't do, what education couldn't do, what the law couldn't do is done in one moment when you obey the gospel. Amen. It's not philosophy. That's not going to save you. It's not your education, and that's fine. I'm not against education. Go and get it and seek it, but don't expect it to save your soul. It's not even in the law. Sure, obey the laws of the land. Sure, obey the laws of God. 
You need to to find your salvation. What saves you is the gospel. We are justified by her faith. Romans 5 and 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are justified by your faith in the gospel. And I'm going to tell you, in the purposes of the Word of God, what faith is, it means you believe in something enough to act on it. How do you have faith in the Scripture? You read it, you believe it, you obey it. That's an exercising faith in the Scripture. It's not enough to say, I have faith. It's not enough to say, I believe in the Bible or I believe in God. It has to be an action on the Scripture. It is hearing, receiving, and acting upon the Word of God. And it's no different in the Gospel. The faith of the Gospel that saves you is your action toward it. Your action toward repentance. Your action toward baptism in Jesus' name. And your action that brings you to be filled with the wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are justified by faith. The word justify means to be just, to be innocent, to be righteous, to treat us as if we are innocent, to pardon, forgive, to remit sin, to treat us as if it never happened. I'm sure some of you can agree with me here today. There's some things in your life that you wish you could go back, rewind, and erase. There's some things you wish you could say, you know what, I just wish it never happened. But that's what God's justification does. It goes back and it treats you as if it never happened. And it's called God's righteousness, not man's righteousness, because it's His plan. It wasn't man's plan. He is the author of this plan. He is the way that God receives us. And His righteousness is how He deals with us. I'm thankful for that today too. Because God is a judge. He doesn't like a lot of the sin He sees in the world. And it is His righteousness that allows Him to extend grace and mercy to you so that you are not judged swiftly and immediately in your sin. He is a righteous God. Righteous means innocent and holy. He is not looking, though, for righteous perfection in you so that He might save you. The righteousness is His. The perfection is His. 1 John 2 and 1, Little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. There is no inherent righteousness in us. I'm here to tell you today, and hope you, hopefully you don't feel this way, but you can never earn God's righteousness. Take it a step further. You will never deserve God's righteousness. The beautiful part of it is, it is God's gift to us. Gift to us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him to be sin. He took your sin upon his shoulders even though he knew no sin. And he did that just so the righteousness of God can be born in you. I am so thankful today for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am so thankful today that God allowed me to find an altar of repentance. And some of you can get with me in this right now. Maybe you're thankful as well. I am thankful that he allowed me to know him. I am thankful that He allowed me to be baptized in His name, taking away the penalty of my own sin and shame. And I am so thankful that He filled me with the wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation 
If you are listening to this message here today, I have a message for you. This gospel of Jesus Christ and His righteousness is for you. His righteousness is here to cover you. He is not, there, look, there is nothing special about me today that brought His mercy and His forgiveness to me. I don't have a promo code. I don't have a free pass. My father was not royalty. I was a sinner. I was lost in my own sin. And Jesus gave me the gift of his righteousness. And what he has done for me today, he has promised he will do for you. All you had to do is have the faith to make the move toward him. It isn't a shame to be a sinner today. Don't be ashamed that you're a sinner. But it is a shame to stay a sinner. It's a shame to stay bound when the Deliverer has extended freedom. It is a shame to be lost when the God of all salvation has extended to you salvation. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Say it with me today. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed to be a one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy roller, born-again believer. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Oh, I'm not ashamed to worship the name of Jesus, Jesus. I'm not ashamed to shout out the name of the Lord. I'm not ashamed to worship the name Jesus! 